Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, my lovelies. How are you doing in this quarantine? As you can see, I have some trouble with hygiene when I'm locked in my house. But uh, next time you see me on video, hopefully I will be clean shaven. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to show you here our Canvas page, uh, Web Campus, Canvas, whatever you want to call it. Um, this video, along with all other videos for this class, will not only be posted on YouTube, but the link to it will uh, will be down here under Lecture Videos and PowerPoints. So the PowerPoint as a PDF and the lecture videos will be linked here. You can also turn in your labs um, here on Canvas. So. Um, so for chapters 14 and 15, those are due on Thursday, this Thursday, April 2nd by 11.59 p.m. And you can just turn them in here. You can upload a file. I've already put up the link for um, chapter 16. So let's, uh, let's just click, if I can, on that and show you. So submit assignment. So basically, uh, as I said, please upload scans or pictures however you can do it, preferably as a single file. So if you take pictures, maybe you could put those together as a PDF uh, or somehow put the, all those pictures together. Um, that, would be, that would be preferable. Um, so if you go to submit assignment, um, just upload the file. Please don't worry about Dropbox or Google Drive. That's probably more of a mess for the both of us. Um, so if you could just select a file from your computer, and submit the assignment, that would be awesome. Um, yes, I would like to leave the site. <clears throat> Let me show you also down here uh, where the quizams are. Uh, we've only taken one so far, the second quizam. Uh, I am canceling because uh, all that stuff we did before spring break, and I know it's been a while, and none of us have time for a review, yada yada. So canceling the second one, I'm giving you all 100%. Thank you, thank you. I wish I could hear the applause. Um, there will be um, the other ones, you know, whichever other ones were planned, those, those will be happening, and I will make more announcements about that later. So can I quit Google Chrome? Can I do it? Yes. All right. So let's go to uh, the trusty PowerPoint here. I'm just going to try to go through quickly what you need to know for Lab 16 because I would like you to do all exercises in Lab 16. It's pretty easy. Um, do, 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 do. There's Lab 16. Everything you will need is at the back of... Lab 16, right? The appendix has images that you can use um, to answer the questions, right? Um, so hopefully you figured that out last time. So let's quickly go over the members of the genus Homo, the species that are within the genus Homo. So we have collectively what we call early Homo because the exact delimitation of species is not um, fully agreed upon. Uh, there's a relatively newly discovered in 2013, I think, um, some fossils of early Homo that they called the Lady Guraru Homo, uh, based on like where it was found, and that was actually discovered by a team that included or was led by our very own Dr. Brian Vilmore from the Anthropology Department at UNLV. Woo woo! Um, but that hasn't been separated into its own species yet because they they have very few. Um, sections of the skeleton. Um, Homo habilis is fairly well recognized, um, although how distinct a species it is is unclear. There, you know, there are um, there's kind of a wide variety of fossils associated with Homo habilis, so it could actually represent multiple species. So collectively, that's early Homo. Later Homo includes. You see, I've color coded it for you. Homo erectus, which is sometimes actually split into two species which I'm not going to have you worry about too much, if at all. But Homo erectus, um, the ones that... Um, Homo erectus was the first Homo species to spread beyond Africa. 
Um, so the ones that were in Africa uh, later on are sometimes called Homo ergaster, and the ones in Asia and in Europe were called Homo erectus, but some people say it's the same species, some people say it became two different species. Then there's Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo sapiens, okay? Um, there are a couple of others. These are the main ones that we're going to talk about. Uh, but there's also something called Homo floresiensis and Denisovans, which don't exactly have a species name yet, which is why it's not Homo something, because um, we found very little of uh, the Denisovan uh, skeleton. So let's let's just go over the basics. When did these different um, Homo species exist? So Homo habilis was from about 2.5 to 1.8 million years ago. So MA is million years ago. Homo erectus sort of picked up where that left off at 1.8 million years ago to 300. KYA is 1,000 years ago, so 300,000 years ago. So that's a pretty long span for Homo erectus. Homo heidelbergensis you see overlapped in time with some populations of Homo erectus, but whether or not they were in the same area um, is a different question. So Homo heidelbergensis was around from 600 to 130,000 years ago. Homo neanderthalensis um, sort of split off of that around 130,000 years ago and was around until 30,000 years ago. And Homo sapiens kind of overlapped with both of those <clears throat> populations um, so we have been around for about 200,000 years, and we're still around if everything goes well. Uh, so yeah, so just graphically, here's, here's a timeline that shows you from 2.5 million years ago to today. Um, so Homo habilis, you see from 2.5 to about 1.8. Homo erectus picking up there about 1.8 to around 300,000 years ago. Homo heidelbergensis there. Um, somewhere around 600,000 years ago ish, 230. Neanderthals, 130 to about 30,000 years ago. Homo sapiens, from about 200,000 years ago to today. So, this might be a little bit different than you thought. It's not super linear. Um, you know, there's sort of twisted branches coming off. Now, this might help to explain how there's some overlap because uh, some of it has to do with where these species are evolving geographically. So Homo habilis existed only in Africa, um, in Eastern Africa, and in Southern Africa. Homo erectus, like I said, was the first Homo species to uh, exist not only in Africa but also in Asia and in Europe. Okay, so those populations, like I said, in Asia and in Europe are sometimes called Homo erectus as opposed to the ones in Africa, which are sometimes called Homo ergaster. Um, but it started in Africa, um, and then maybe those ones later that existed in sort of colder environments um, either evolved mechanisms particular to that environment, or maybe through genetic drift they became somewhat different um, because there were small populations, possibly. Homo heidelbergensis was only in Africa and in Europe. And in, um, in Africa, eventually, Homo heidelbergensis sort of evolved into Homo sapiens. In uh, Western Asia and in Europe, Homo heidelbergensis uh, probably started to evolve into Neanderthals, who were very adapted to cold climates. Um, their bodies, their skulls, etc. Um, but Homo sapiens, once it evolved in Africa, later on Homo sapiens spread out, obviously, throughout the globe and began interbreeding to some slight extent with other Homo populations that lived there, and eventually um, those other species sort of ceased to exist as such, okay? Um, so the lab is going to focus a lot on cranial morphology, that is the morphology of the skull. So I know this isn't the greatest picture at all, but um, 
Homo habilis is the one on the left there, and Homo erectus is the one on the right. So the main the main difference is that Homo habilis had a much smaller cranial capacity. So so you know the the part of the cranium um, that encloses the brain is obviously a bit smaller, um, whereas in Homo erectus it's sort of more oblong. Um, also. Um, it's hard to see from this picture, but Homo erectus had something called an occipital torus, which was like sort of a ring of bone around the back, the bottom of the back of the skull, um, and was just a bigger, more robust skull in general. Um, so the cranial capacity of Homo habilis was about 650 cubic centimeters. That's what CC is over here. Um, so this is this uh, column is Homo habilis, and this column is Homo erectus. So this shows you maybe a little bit better um, that Homo erectus had a broader face, sort of like just more robust bones, a larger skull in general. Um, the brow ridge was bigger in Homo erectus. Okay. Um, so here's here's Homo erectus. It, uh, like I said, it had a, more of an oblong skull. You see this occipital torus. Um, so it's not the best diagram of it, but it was like a ridge of bone that you could really sort of feel kind of around the bottom of the back of the skull. Large supraorbital torus, which is a fancy word for a big protruding brow ridge. Um, and... Here's the difference between Homo uh, ergaster and Homo erectus. So ergaster is the first column, erectus is the second column. Um, these came from, originally came from the population within Africa, but after there was a split of some uh, populations that went into Asia and Europe, those ones kind of um, developed uh, into a more robust uh, um kind of version. So you'll notice this one on the right has a sagittal keel, which I don't have, but uh but it's sort of like where the where the skull comes kind of to a small point. It's not a sagittal crest. It's not actually a ridge of bone that sticks out and it doesn't really have to do with chewing muscle attachment. It's just a feature of the skull of Homo erectus in Asia and Europe. The brow ridge was was bulkier um, just the skull was kind of bigger in general, like everything was exaggerated. And this one, Homo ergaster, is representative more of the populations that were within Africa. Um, then we have Homo heidelbergensis. Heidelbergensis, like I said, was, um, you know, had evolved in Africa and was found also in Europe. Um, the name Heidelbergensis it comes from it being found, the first specimen being found in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, <clears throat> so the cranial capacity you see is, is getting larger. It's 1,200 to 1,300 cc's on average. Um, Homo erectus, um, you know, represented the first major increase in brain size, um, but it was really... Um, it, it had a really broad range from around 600 cubic centimeters to 1,200 cubic centimeters. Um, the average, I think I said, let me go back here, is 950 cubic centimeters. All right. So we see this continued trend of increase in brain size. Um, so according to this diagram, uh, Homo heidelbergensis still has an occipital torus back here. Um, really big brow ridges. You see those things are like massive. It's like big, uh, big headlights. Um, the skull was a bit, a bit more like rounded. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it just, it had a larger, um, uh, larger brain case basically. Um, so the, you're not going to have to do too much with Heidelbergensis. I think there is one thing on Heidelbergensis in your chapter. Um, but, you know, when in doubt, you can compare the size of the uh, brain case um, and and any kind of identifying features like the occipital torus means it's either Heidelbergensis or Homo erectus. Um, but Heidelbergensis is going to have a larger brain case, generally speaking, and even be, uh, even more massive brow ridge. Okay. 
Um, so looking at Neanderthals, Neanderthals actually had the largest average cranial capacity of any of the Homo species, even larger than ours on average. We don't know what that means. Doesn't necessarily mean they were smarter than us. I mean, they're gone and we're here. <laughs> um, but um, but they did have larger larger uh, cranial capacity on average. Um, it could have been because they had larger bodies. I mean, they were shorter, but they were stocky. Um, you know, could have scaled up with their body size. It could have had something to do with temperature, um, just, you know, because the brain produces a lot of heat. Um, so we don't know about the organization of, uh, you know, the neurons in the brain because that has a lot to do with intelligence as well. But here's some features of the skull. Um, they had a long, flat, low brain case, almost like a football. You know, sometimes I feel like I've got a little bit of a Neanderthal skull going on or maybe an alien skull, um, the forehead was receding. So we have sort of a, you know, more of a forehead. It doesn't go back straight after the brow ridge. You know, it's not like, <laughs> um, but there's pretty much right after the brow ridge, it starts going back. Um, they also have, again, a brow ridge. It looks like it's a bit less massive than Heidelbergensis, but they still have a brow ridge. They have a really large nasal cavity. And that might be um, because they lived in very cold, dry environments. And we have these um, sort of uh, spirals, little spirals of bone in our nose that are covered with mucous membranes and help to um, like warm up and moisten, humidify the air as we breathe it in. So it could have had something to do with that, but we're not sure. Um, they did not have a chin. None of these uh, homo species, except for homo sapiens, have a chin. So, um, you know, however weak your chin might be, uh, you know, this the fact that you have a mental eminence, it's called, that actually kind of juts out here, um, is unique to homo sapiens. So for Neanderthals, it just, it just goes straight back. Um, they did not have an occipital torus, but they had something called an occipital bun, uh, which is almost like a dinner roll attached to the back of the skull that you could pretty much grab grab onto. Um, so compare that with Homo sapiens. So we have a vertical forehead. So it's almost like the brain case, instead of going way back, was sort of shifted. So it's like, it's up. It's almost sitting on top of our faces. Um, so that actually allows for more, more sort of space. Um, the back of our cranium is more rounded than theirs is. And our face is is uh, is flatter, um, so you, you'll notice that here there's a projecting mid face. It kind of comes out a bit more, um, whereas for Homo sapiens it tends to be flatter. Okay, and again the chin, the cranial capacity on average for our species, depending on what source you're looking at, is going to be somewhere between 1350 and 1400 cubic centimeters. So tool technologies, that's another thing that they're going to ask about. First of all, in discussing tool technologies, there are a few parts. There's the, the core, which is the, the rock that is that the tool is going to come from in one way or another. Um, there's a hammer stone or some kind of percussive thing that you're going to use to smash against the core. And then there's the debitage, which is made up of uh, flakes, that come off of the core, right? Some of that is just waste. Some of that might become tools, depending on what type of technology you're using. Um, here's a different way of looking at it. You hold the hammer stone, you beat it against the core, and flakes will fly off. And there are telltale scars or signs on the core of where those flakes were coming from that you can see like right here. So this flake kind of came off of the core and left left a scar here. All right. So the earliest stone tool technology is associated with early Homo. So, for example, Homo habilis. Um, and the early populations of Homo erectus also used this, and it was, it was very simple. Um, you had a core. Uh, it was struck to knock off some flakes and to make a sharp edge, and that was kind of it. Um, this is a this is called a chopper. This is probably used for crushing bones um, to get at the marrow. Um, and it, it, like I said, it was really simple. You take the hammer stone, you hit the core, 
You knock off flakes and those flakes are just trash. You're not really using them. The core becomes your tool. All right, so that's important. So here you're making the core into a tool in and of itself. The same goes for Acheulean technology, uh, which is associated with Homo erectus. So they sort of developed this. They started out using Old Wan technology and then figured out how to do Acheulean technology, um, which also works by knocking flakes off of a core, but you're shaping it, you're making it by face, by facial, which means that uh, you're napping flakes off of both sides to produce something that's relatively symmetrical um, that has a sharp cutting edge around it. So these are called hand axes, this particular type that are sort of teardrop shaped. And they could be used either for cutting things, uh, for chopping things, and maybe also for digging out roots and stuff in the ground. Okay, so the thing that makes this different is that it's flaked on both sides, it's bifacial. Um, and and symmetrical, um, so it does require a bit more planning, and it's hard to make those edges nice and thin and sharp. Um, then we have um, Mousterian technology, which was developed first by Homo heidelbergensis, but was used um, a lot by Neanderthals. So Mousterian technology is made using a technique called the Lavalois technique. But before I get into that, these are examples of Mousterian tools. Um, so it's a more diverse toolkit. Um, you've got things that could be attached to spears. You've got things for cutting. You've got uh, tools maybe for scraping, like to help process leather, you know, scraping things off the leather, making it nice and smooth. Um, you've got things maybe for drilling holes into leather. Um, so it's a diverse toolkit. And here's one thing that makes it quite different from the others is that you still have a hammerstone and a core but the core isn't going to become your tool the flakes are going to become your tool so first you you knock some flakes off the core you sort of prepare it you're looking for a shape that's forming on the core as you knock off flakes that then finally you can hit it with one last strike and knock off this piece, this flake of the core that already has a predetermined shape and maybe predetermined properties, you know how it's going to behave. Um, and then you're going to take that flake that comes off and you're going to retouch it, which means you're going to uh, fashion it into something specific. You know, a scraper, uh, a point for like a, like a spear, um, you know, a, a an, an awl or something to, to dig in to make holes into leather, um, etc. So, yeah, so that's Mousterian technology. Um, Homo sapiens uh, developed other tool technologies. So one of the earliest broad types of uh, toolkits is called Upper Paleolithic. Um, so Paleolithic means the old Stone Age. Upper Paleolithic is like means we're not talking about Oldowan, we're not talking about um, Acheulean or Mousterian, we're talking about something different. Um, so this was used by Homo sapiens, and you, you might notice um, these are blades and points, and they're very, very thin, right? And it's really hard to get, you know, a stone or a flint material to behave in a specific way um, to make it that thin and sharp without breaking it, right? So so this represents an advance in this type of technology. And if you see this tool on the far right, this one over here, um, if you can see my cursor, it's called a burin. Uh, believe it or not, that's, that is an intentional shape. And this part up here is used to carve, like uh, carving designs or features into maybe bone tools, for example, or maybe carving wood. Um, so these are specific types of tools. Um, all right, so we haven't talked about Homo floresiensis. It's kind of a footnote, but it's interesting. Homo floresiensis was discovered on the island of Flores, which is right down here in Indonesia. You see kind of next to Borneo, not so far from uh, uh, New Guinea and Australia. This New Guinea here is connected to Australia because this is the landmass as it existed um, tens of thousands of years ago, okay? Um, 
the gray is is the shoreline today or is is the extent of uh the landmass today so homo floresiensis probably existed from around 75,000 years ago until 15,000 years ago that means it existed at the same time and possibly in similar areas as homo sapiens we know homo sapiens were in australia by 50,000 years ago so so probably our ancestors we're like, hey, what's up, Homo floresiensis? Um, they were super tiny. They were tiny, tiny, tiny. They were like three feet tall or something. Sometimes they're called the hobbit species. Um, and the weird thing is they had a cranial capacity of 385 to 417 cubic centimeters. So that's smaller than chimpanzees. Um, the thought is that they probably evolved from a population of Homo sapiens um, and went through... Um, a process called island dwarfism where large creatures tend to get smaller on islands because there's fewer resources and so it's just more efficient to have a smaller body size um, so it's crazy that there was a hominin species that coexisted at least in time with homo sapiens that had a cranial capacity that was smaller than chimpanzees that's kind of insane um, so if you're trying to identify this skull, you'll notice the face is pretty flat, um, but it's tiny. You know, the skull is tiny, right? So that's pretty much what you need to know. So that is it of the information you need for this lab chapter. So I'll remind you, do all exercises. That's one through six in chapter 16 and turn that in on Canvas. You have uh, a week to do it. So turn it in by April seventh I believe it is uh, next Tuesday at 11 59 p.m. by 11 59 p.m. not at okay um, if you haven't already don't forget to turn in chapters 14 and 15 on canvas by Thursday this Thursday the 2nd of April 11 59 p.m. at the latest um, and if you haven't already turned in lab 6 from before spring break which includes chapters 10 11 and 12 um, please email that to me. Some of you have done that. Um, if you didn't turn it in before spring break, like I said, I'm behind on, uh, on grading. So, uh, cut me some slack and I'll cut you some slack, uh, because I'm finishing up my dissertation. And if all goes well in about a week and a half, I will be Dr. Mark. Yeah. You can still call me Mark. As I said before, Quizam 2 is canceled. You all got 100%. Woo -woo. So, uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to email me. And I hope all is well with you guys. And I will see you on the other side. Peace.